Uh, if you take your Bibles, turn to Second Chronicles. It's going to take us a little while to get there, but we will get there. So Second Chronicles. We're going to sort of lead into it. But we're going to talk about revival tonight. So what do you think of when you hear the word revival? Can somebody answer me? (laughs) Preaching, all right. Anything else? So every week, right? All right. So revival. Oftentimes, if you're like me, you think of something to do with church, right? So preaching or singing or special meetings or something like that. And we don't often use the word revival outside of a church setting, uh, but we use a lot of other words in its place, more uh, trendy words, I guess, revitalization or resurgence or renewal or rejuvenation and restoration, right? Uh, Lately, I've noticed a revival of things from the past, things like crocheting. (laughs) Leanna knows, I saw her crocheting the other day. Uh, I went to the mall the other day and these two ladies just sat there and talked and crocheted for a couple hours. I have blankets my grandma crocheted for me, so it's coming back in style to crochet. Uh, Wide leg jeans or bell bottoms, those are coming back. Yeah, I know. Pastor can pull his out and he'll be good to go. Uh, We got things like tie-dye shirts are coming back. Scrunchies. Yeah, so Miss Alyssa can pull hers out. Cargo pants. I used to have lots of those. Long jean skirts are coming back. Fanny packs are coming back. Or they did come back. I don't know if they're still back. Are Are they back? And then you wear them across your body so that it's not really a fanny pack, right? Okay. So many more things. And it proves that you should just never throw out your old clothes, right? Because in 20 or 30 years, they'll be back in style. I just thought about it. I'm sure grandma had a lot of stuff that we could have pulled and it's in style again today, right? So, but we like to see things revived and refreshed and renewed. Usually there's just a little bit of a change to it. Um, I was thinking YouTube is full of things like car cleaning, There's this great guy on YouTube that we have found, and he takes cars that are just trashed and makes them look brand new again. Or you have those guys who clean the the yards that are like covering over the cement, and they go through, and they cut it, and they cut the lawn, and they reveal the cement. And we like to watch those things. It's satisfying to watch because we like to see something that's in rough shape get renewed and refreshed into something new. You've got home renovation shows. You've got all these things that take something that's in rough shape and it brings it back into something that is new, something that is nice, something that has been refreshed. And our revival meetings are coming up in just a few days, and it's a time that we as a church usually look forward to each year where we're excited for it. We bring in a special speaker. We have extra nights of services. The choir sings special music each night. Uh, We put time and effort and money into it, excuse me, with the desire that God would work. And while we understand what it means to be restored or renewed in terms of a car or fashion or something like that. Uh, We don't often have a clear understanding of what it means to have a spiritual revival. So as we get started tonight, I'm going to ask one question. It's the title of my message, and really a question that each one of us needs to ask ourselves as we come into our revival meetings, and that is, do you want revival? We have to answer that question, because we can have all the meetings in the world, but if we don't desire and want revival, it's not going to come. So let's pray, and we're going to look at revival tonight. Lord, thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for a great time that we've had in your house so far today. And I pray, Lord, that you would, Lord, use your word. Uh, Lord, use what you've laid on my heart tonight, Lord, to speak to us, to challenge us, Lord, with this question of if we want revival, and if we do, if we're preparing for it. And Lord, I just pray that you would use uh, tonight, use your word, and uh, bless this time together, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. So before we can accurately answer the question, do you want revival, we have to define revival, right? What is revival? We can't want something if we don't know what it is to begin with, okay? So the word revival, again, we use it a lot in the church world, but what does it mean? Uh, This year and in in past years, we've challenged you to pray for 30 days of revival, so we gave out bookmarks this year. We've done this in the past with all the days laid out for you just as a reminder and said, okay, challenge, or we've challenged you to pray for revival in your life, uh, in our church, in our country, in our world, but what do we mean when we say pray for revival? Essentially, revival is taking something that was dead and bringing it back to life. We're reviving it. We're changing it. It's it's going from dead to life. And that's the essence of what we mean when we talk about a spiritual revival. It's an awakening, uh, a making alive of something that was neglected and forgotten. So this means that revival, it's not something that can happen to someone who has never been alive in the first place. 
Okay, so revival is something that is reserved for the people of God, people who have trusted in Christ. Uh, one definition I, I came across said this. It said, revival refers to a spiritual reawakening from a state of dormancy or stagnation in the life of a believer. It encompasses the resurfacing of a love for God, an appreciation of God's holiness, a passion for his word and his church, a convicting awareness of personal and corporate sin, a spirit of humility and a desire for repentance and growth in righteousness. That's a really complete uh, definition of revival. <clears throat> the United States has had a lot of uh, revivals, and the main one is called, we call the Great Awakening. And it was really three and possibly, I believe, four waves of revival that spread throughout the U.S. And there was an awakening during that time of the spiritually stagnant, people who came, people who might have been in church, but were stagnating in their, in their faith, an awakening to the things of God and a renewal of a love for Christ. And we often associate revival with great emotion, right? When we think of a revival, we think of people crying in the pews and uh, coming to the altar, and we think of that great emotion. And there should be some emotion when it comes to God's working and reviving in a life. Because when we recognize the depth of our sin and the depth of our indifference towards God and His Word, when we recognize that we have strayed from God, there should be some emotion. There should be some emotion when we turn back to Him and find His forgiveness and restoration, but revival is not all about the emotion. Okay, emotion, yes, is a part of it, but it's not what it is all about. In a message on revival and really in response to criticism of the emotion that uh, is sometimes shown, D.L. Moody said that anything is preferable to deadness. (laughs) And sometimes all we have around us is deadness. And then we look down on those who show some emotion when God revives them and restores them, when they find forgiveness or freedom from something in their lives and they're revived in their love for God and in their walk with Him. And we say, oh man, look at that person. And yet in our lives, we are spiritually dead. So it is possible, yes, to have emotion and no true repentance, but true revival will involve repentance and a confession of our sins to God. Oswald Smith said that we will have to first, or deal first of all with the question of sin. For unless our lives are right in the sight of God, unless sin has been put away, we may pray until doomsday and the revival will never come. So yes, emotion is part of it, but not the whole thing. But revival also involves repentance and confession. Because if we're not right with God personally, we cannot expect a revival personally or corporately or as a nation. We pray for revival, we talk about revival, but we often don't want revival in our personal lives. It starts with you. It starts with you saying, okay, there's a sin that needs to be repented of so I can have revival. There is confession and repentance and a turning from that sin. It might include changing what you watch, what you listen to, what you talk about, what you read. It might include admitting the pride that you have in yourself spiritually or just in life in general or maybe uh, the anger that you struggle with. Maybe you need to confess the unforgiveness and bitterness that you've held on to in your life and make that right. All of those are sin. You say, oh, I can hold on to that for a little bit longer. No. If you want true revival, that sin needs to be confessed. Maybe it's jealousy or impatience or dishonesty or gossiping or a criticizing spirit. All of those things are sins. And we love the idea of revival, but we don't love what revival would mean for us personally. Okay, and I, I briefly touched on this last week with talking about a willing heart. We have things in our lives that we love too much to obey God. Or we have things in our life that we love too much to get right with God. I like that grudge I'm holding on to a little too much because I don't really like that person. (laughs) Or I like that sin that I'm doing a little too much because, you know what, I just, I really enjoy that. And we're unwilling to give it up. So we say, man, I love the idea of revival. It would be so great to see God work in our church. It'd be so great to see revival in my life and in our church's life. But then God says, well, here's something you need to get right first. And we say, well, okay, maybe not God. Because I don't love what it means for me personally. I don't love what it means I'm going to have to do. Revival will include confession and repentance. A stirring in our hearts and a renewal of our love for God. An understanding of who God is and a desire to grow in Him. Revival is also not something that's a one-time event. It usually has to happen all the time. Over and over and over again. A continual process. We're constantly in need of an awakening, of an awareness of our spiritual condition and of our love for God. Again, if you look back to the Great Awakening, they have this great revival. It needs to happen again. In America, in Canada, they need a revival again. It wasn't just, well, we had this one revival and now for the rest of time we're good. 
In the Old Testament, we see the nation of Israel experiencing revival many times. And I love how when we look at the Old Testament, we often look back and we look at Israel and think, what were they thinking? Right? They had all these signs from God. They saw God do so much for them. And yet we could look at ourselves and say the same thing. We've seen God do so much for us. And yet we turn from him over and over and over again. So, for example, the nation of Israel, not long removed from God's deliverance of them from Egypt, fell into idolatry. That period was then followed by the restoration of the people and the building of the tabernacle in Exodus chapter 32 through 36. In 1 Samuel, and we're going to get there soon in our study, the Ark of the Covenant is taken by the Philistines in battle. The people have strayed from God. The priest Eli and his sons we've looked at were far from God. And so God allows the Ark to be taken. They're defeated in battle. And in 1 Samuel 7, the Ark is recovered. And Samuel tells them in verse 3, he says, If ye, <clears throat> if ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you, and prepare your hearts unto the Lord, and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So they get the ark back, and Samuel says, Okay, if you do return unto the Lord, if you're serious about this, this is what you need to do. You need to get rid of the strange gods and the idols. And in verse 4, <clears throat> there's the revival. Then the children of Israel did put away Balaam and Ashtaroth, and served the Lord only. So too often, though, we put an emphasis on the emotion. Right? There was not enough emotion for that to be a true revival. All right? Or we put a lot of uh, emphasis on the event. Well, that didn't happen at revival meetings. So was that really a revival? But simply put, revival is not a meeting. It's not an event. It's not an emotion. It is the work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of the people of God. And as we've heard over a couple of weeks, it involves a willing heart and a ready heart on our part that as God works, we respond to that. So we know what revival is, but why do we need it? Or what is the need for revival? It's really needed because we've never arrived. Okay, we've never arrived when it comes to our relationship with God. And I believe every person, regardless of where you are at spiritually, can benefit from revival personally. You might say, well, man, I am doing great spiritually. Well, you can still benefit from God working in your life. This is something true of life as well. I mean, we, we see this all around us. If you stop growing in any area of life, you start dying in that area, right? Uh, we start declining. If I don't exercise for months or years, my fitness declines. If we don't read or attempt to learn, we find ourselves behind when it comes to understanding what is going on around us. If you don't uh, continue to learn at your job, you're eventually left without a job, right? Because you stopped learning and stopped growing. And in the same way, when we stop growing spiritually, we start to decline spiritually, we start to fall away from where we should be. So if revival is God working in our lives and really spiritual growth is God working in our lives, then all of us can benefit from a revival in our lives. And if we truly want revival, it has to start with the individual. And so we've never or we've not arrived when it comes to our relationship with God, but revival is also needed because we are away from God. And I'm not just referring to those who aren't in church or those who are obviously living a sinful life. This applies to those who are in church. For every service, but leave God out of their lives the rest of the time. This applies to those who only open their Bibles when at church, or who only pray for a meal or when called upon. These are those who maybe say, well, you know, I attend church, I read my Bible, and I pray, but I never see God work in my life, because they're more concerned with the outside appearance than what is happening on the inside. We also need revival when there is sin in our lives, and if we're honest, we always have sin in our lives. We're never going to be sinless. And so there's always something that we need God's forgiveness, God's help with. You might say, well, you know, maybe you're living in sin. And by that, we, we think that, that, that thought of, you know what, you're in sin and you know it and you just don't care. Maybe you, though, have an unconfessed sin that you need to make right with God. Or maybe you just tolerate sin. We've talked about that the last couple of weeks in 1 Samuel 2. And apathy towards it, it doesn't bother you. And you become hardened to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. But we also need revival to renew our passion for God. We get so passionate about other things in our lives and yet have no passion for the God who saved us and who wants to have a relationship with us. And really what it comes down to is we're never going to see revival if we're unwilling to sacrifice the things that may be hindering our walk with God. And that could be, there's so many different things, but if it's hindering our walk with God, if we're not willing to give it up, we're not going to see revival. They're not necessarily bad things. Uh, back to D.L. Moody preaching on revival, he mentioned something that was happening at the time of his writing, um, and he said he talked of, in his message, bearing down on the bicycle. 
Okay, he said that one of the great temptations they were going to have, these students, was the bicycle. And I laughed. I like biking. Okay, I like cycling. And it was delivered in 1899. The bicycle was having a boom. The safety bicycle had been invented, which is basically what we now know as a bike. So instead of the big wheeled penny farthings, all right, now they had this safety bicycle. And in this message, he talks of how there would be the temptation for these young people to take their bikes and go out to the country and neglect their souls and to neglect the church, to neglect Sunday school, to neglect Bible classes. He wasn't saying the bike was evil, but he was saying we often replace a passion for God with a passion for something else. If you were in Sunday school this morning, we talked about that with the nation of Israel, and we talked about Ahab actually this morning and Elijah and Mount Carmel. And they, had, they had changed what they were focusing on. And we talked about God being a jealous God of their worship. And they had taken that attention, that worship that was due God only and replaced it with something else. Okay, my passion for cycling is not wrong, but if it takes the place of God in my life, then it becomes wrong. Okay, and I don't know what it may be for you. It could be a TV show or a relationship, a boyfriend, girlfriend, a friend, a job. If it takes God's place in your life, if it draws you away from God, the thing that is, if it's hindering your walk with God, then it is wrong. And we place so many things over God that it really should not surprise us when there's no revival in our lives. And while none of those things or some of those things might not be wrong in and of themselves, but when they take our focus and attention away from God, they hinder us having revival in our lives. So revival is an awakening, a making alive of that which was dead or near death. And we need revival because many Christians are near dead spiritually. There's no interest in God. Uh, There's no interest in following Him. There's only an interest in their own wants and their own desires and their own comfort. But if we truly want to see revival, we have to be willing to say, I'm going to put aside those things that I like, those comforts in my life. I'm going to give up the things that are hindering God from working in me and changing my life. I have a book on revival praying, and uh, actually we listened to a message a couple weeks ago by Brother Scott Pauley, and what he said in this book is said, we are in pursuit of everything on earth except the Lord Jesus Christ. And really, when it comes down to revival, people say, why don't we see more revival? It's because we're too focused on everything else except Jesus. Focus on everything that we want, everything that makes us happy, instead of saying what makes him happy. So what are you pursuing over God? So, definition of a revival, the need of, or for revival, but really where I want to focus, how do we prepare for revival? So we start in four days, revival. Are you prepared? Now, I'm not asking if you've made sure to schedule the time off, that you're going to be here the extra nights and be here on the Saturday. I'm asking if you're prepared to let God work in your life. And again, we've heard three messages on this in the last two weeks or three weeks. Have you prepared your heart to hear from God, and have you prepared yourself to not just hear God's word, but do it? Do you have a willing heart, a ready heart? And the true test of our heart's desire for revival, if we say, yes, I want revival, the true test of that is whether or not we are ready and willing to obey God when he speaks to us. So 2 Chronicles chapter 7, this is one Old Testament passage that uh, speaks to preparing for a revival, and we're really in this point going to break it down. So the context of the passage is the completion of Solomon's temple and the consecration or consecration of it. At the beginning of the chapter, Solomon finishes his prayer. God sends fire from heaven to consume the burnt offerings and sacrifices that they had offered to him. God's glory fills the temple. The priests could not enter. And when the people of Israel see the fire come down and the glory of the Lord upon the temple, they bow and they worship God. They continue to offer sacrifices. They keep a feast for seven days. And we're told in verse 10 that everyone left glad and merry in heart for the goodness that the Lord had showed. We're going to start reading in verse number 12. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for an house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain or if I command the locusts to devour the land or if I send pestilence among my people. And so God really, this verse, and we're going to continue with the next one in just a second, but God gives an example. He says, okay, I've heard your prayer. I've chosen this place. But then he says, here, this is what judgment might be if I shut up the heaven, if I command the locusts to devour the land, if I send pestilence. He gives this hypothetical situation, and then he tells Solomon what needs to be done by the people to see forgiveness and a revival. Verse 14, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray 
and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. So again, we know this passage is written, yes, to the nation of Israel, but I also know, again, I've mentioned this before, that all Scripture is given by God and all Scripture is profitable. In 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, we are called a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which hath not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So we look at this command that was given to a people that God had said was called by his name. I believe we can apply this passage to us as Christians, a chosen generation and those who are now the people of God. And so God says, okay, when you stray from me, Israel, here is what you need to do to come back to me. And I think the things God mentions here in verse 14, we can take and now apply to us saying we've strayed from God. How do we come back to him? How do we prepare for revival? The first thing is to humble themselves. This is the hardest part because humbling ourselves before God means that we see ourselves as God sees us. This is not something that I can do for you or anybody else can do for us. This is something that is an intensely personal thing for us to do, to humble ourselves before God, to bow before Him and say, okay, I recognize and see myself how you see me. So when you see your sin or recognize your sin, it should humble you before God. Do you recognize your dependence upon him for everything in life? And does that humble you before him? 1 Peter 5, 6 says to humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. If we we want to see God work and to exalt us, to revive us, we have to start with humility before him. If I come to God saying, I'm good, God, I don't need anything, God's not going to revive me to begin with because I am not humble before him. But Second Chronicles also says that we need to pray. If you look at the revivals of the past, most of them started with prayer, not with a meeting, not with a special speaker, not with somebody coming over to preach from England or whatever it might have been. It started with a few people who said, we are going to pray. I can't remember the one now that's coming to mind, but I think it was New York City, and it started with two guys who met every day at lunch to pray, and that grew and grew and grew, and God used their humble hearts before him, their desire for revival, their prayer to do and to start something great. So are you praying for God to work? Are you praying that God would work in you? That's why we challenge you to pray for 30 days so that you could say, God, please work in me. Prayer is our direct line to God. And if we expect God to work, then we have to go to him in prayer and ask him to work. So Solomon or God also tells Solomon that the people have to seek his face. So humble yourself before God, pray, and seek his face. Basically, pursue after God. And I mentioned it earlier, we often pursue other things and put other things above God, whether it's happiness or wealth or fame or love or whatever, but we don't seek after God. Jeremiah 29 tells us that ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. So we need to humble ourselves, we need to pray, we need to seek his face, and the last thing is, Uh, it says, is to turn from their wicked ways. We have to be willing to turn from our sin if we want revival. God is not going to do a great work in our lives when we're harboring sin. It doesn't matter how big of a sin we think it is. If we are keeping sin in our lives, then we can't expect God to do a great work in our life. Because we can do all the things mentioned above. We can humble ourselves. We can pray. We can seek his face, but if we are unwilling to turn from our sin, there will be no revival. Okay, just think about it. I can humble myself. God, I'm humble before you. God, I'm praying. I'm seeking your face. But then God says, here's a sin that needs to be turned from. And you say, no, there's no revival that's going to happen because you have shut it down at the last step. So as we approach revival this week, Would you take time to humble yourself before God, to pray, to seek his face, to forsake your sin? Because if we don't address the lack of these things in our lives, then we shouldn't be surprised when we come all weekend, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday, Sunday, and we say, well, God didn't work in my heart. Pastor talked about a little bit this morning. There's the soil in Mark chapter four. We say, well, God didn't work. Were you prepared? Were you ready for him to work? 
Because if you truly desire revival, if you say, and you look at that question, do you want revival? Say yes, then you've got to prepare for it. And then you've got to have a willing and a ready heart to do what God works in your heart about. So after we've prepared for a revival, what are the results of revival? Look at verse 14 again. Gives us an indication of what we can or what we can expect. It says, Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. So God gives this list. If they shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. He says that he will hear us, forgive us, and heal us. Who wouldn't want to see revival then, right? God is going to do this in our lives. Why wouldn't we want to see it? And as we truly seek after God, as we truly come to him asking for revival, there will be visible results in our lives. Again, an emotional experience coming to the altar and then no change in your life says no revival happened. A emotional experience saying, I need to do this or I need to make this right or I need to get rid of this sin and then nothing happening afterwards means no revival took place. A true revival is going to result in some visible results in our lives. And we need to realize that God will hear us. Isaiah 59 tells us, though, that our sins get in the way of God hearing our prayers. Proverbs 28 tells us that he that covereth his sins shall not prosper. So we can't expect God to work when we will not turn to him and confess our sin and seek his forgiveness. When God hears us, or God, when God hears us we can know that he will forgive our sins. We love 1 John 1, 9 that tells us if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We have a promise from God that if we come to him and if we confess our sins, we will be forgiven and yet we don't take him up on that very often. We like to hold on to it instead. But a result of revival coming to our lives will be the forgiveness of sins, but I also believe that a result of revival will be the forsaking of sin. Because a true repentance and seeking of God then leads to us forsaking what brought us to that point in the first place. Okay, we can come to God anytime and say, God, I need your forgiveness. And he will be there and say, I forgive. But then God says, I want you to forsake it as well. And as God works in our heart, a true repentance says, okay, I'm repenting of this, God. I need forgiveness. I need you to restore our relationship. But then that repentance also says, I don't want anything to do with that sin anymore. The rest of Proverbs 28, it tells us at the beginning, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper. But then the second part says, whoso, conf or whoso confesseth and forsaketh them, the sins, shall have mercy. It doesn't mean that you're immune to the sin immediately, okay? But it, it has this sense of abandoning something, of leaving it behind. So when you're right with God, you won't be seeking to go back to your sin, you will have left it behind. Your desire will not be for that sin, but will instead be for God. And oftentimes, though, again, we have that emotional experience. We say, I'm going to, Lord, I need your forgiveness. He gives that forgiveness. But we didn't truly then turn and say, okay, I'm going to leave this behind and forsake it. I confessed it. I got forgiveness, but I didn't forsake it. When we forsake sin and leave it behind, our relationship with God and with others will be restored. Our hearts will be renewed. Our lives will be changed. Another result of revival is not only God hearing and forgiving, but then it said God heal, healed their land. He says, I will heal their land. And I believe that when we, as individuals, where it starts, if we seek God and we seek revival in our lives, the effect of that revival on us will reach more people than we could imagine. Because when revival happens, everyone will take notice. A revived life has a far greater impact than any revival meeting. Because as you make right the sin of pride or anger in your heart towards others, your attitude towards them changes. And they notice that there's a difference that has taken place. Your spouse, your children, your brothers and sisters in Christ, your co-workers and employees and friends, they will all take notice when you've experienced revival in your life. Not just a surface, okay, that was great but a true repentance, turning, confessing, forsaking of your sin. Your prayers for others to experience God's working will increase. You'll start praying for people more. Your prayers for the lost will increase. And soon you're not just going to be praying, but you'll be doing because there's been a revival in your heart. When we are revived and awakened by the Spirit of God working in us, the gospel will be preached to those around us. 
A revival in our hearts will give us a desire to see others come to know Christ. And that's why throughout history, revivals have seen many come to know Christ because it happened first in the Christian. I mentioned that one again. I can't remember the name of it. But started with two men praying, having an individual revival that then spread to more people coming to see what it was all about. They put it in the paper. People showed up to pray at lunchtime every day. And it grew and grew and people got saved because there was an individual revival. It happened in the Christian who then shared the good news of the gospel with those around them. So as we finish tonight, I'm coming back to that one question. Do you want revival? In the book of Revelation, John writes to the churches at the beginning. I think Pastor mentioned it this morning in his message. To the church at Ephesus, he told them that they had left their first love. To the church in Sardis, he wrote that they had a name that thou livest, but in reality they were dead. To the church of the Laodiceans, he wrote, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. It's a sad state for many of these churches, but the churches are made up of people. And so these statements by John in Revelation were equally true of the individuals in the church. A church doesn't have a name that thou livest, but in reality be dead if the people are not dead. So as we come to revival in just a few days, could it be said about you that you have left your first love? Could it be said that you have the name of Christ that thou livest, yet you're living like you're dead? Could it be said that you are neither cold nor hot? I don't know about you, but I, I don't want that to be said of me. And I want to challenge you, before Thursday comes, humble yourself before God. Pray earnestly for revival in your life. Seek Him and turn from your sin. Don't worry about anyone else in the church. Don't worry about anyone else in your family. Worry about yourself and your heart. Don't just come to our revival meetings and go through the motions and say, well, I'm here and I heard the preaching, but truly seek God and ask Him to change your heart because revival starts with you. If we're going to see revival in our church, in our nation, in our world, it has to start with individuals who are sick of their sin, sick of the status quo, just going along, doing the same old, same old, and who are asking God to change them. And if I were to ask any of you tonight, if you want to know God, if you want to experience His working in your life, I have no doubt most of you would say, yes, I want revival. But how many of us are willing to do what needs to be done to be made right with God? How many of us are willing to get rid of the things that need to be get, gotten rid of in our lives so that we can be right with God? We say that we have the desire, but our actions are what show whether or not we really mean it. Leonard Ravenhill was a man who spent most of his life in ministry focusing on prayer and revival. And he once said this, he said, as long as we are content to live without revival, we will. We have meetings coming up, and I'm excited to have Dr. Getch here. I'm excited to hear what God has laid on his heart. But I can come and listen and not be searching for revival. I can come and listen, I can come and lead the singing, I can come and sing in special groups, but not have a willing heart that is ready for God to work. I can come and not have a willing heart that is ready to act on what God does in my heart. I can come and say, well, God spoke, but I'm going to ignore him. God pointed to a certain sin, but you know what, I'm okay with that sin, I like it. So as long as we're content to live without revival, we will. If we say, you know what, I'm happy where I'm at. I'm happy in my sin. I'm happy in the apathy that I'm living in. I'm happy in the stagnation that I just come to church and go through the motions and everything's good. If you're content with that, don't expect God to work this weekend. At least not in you. Because he won't. He's going to say, well, their heart's hard. He might speak to you and you might say, ah, that's good, God, I'm good. I don't want to get rid of that sin. I don't want to get rid of that uh, thing in my life, that pride, that anger, that, uh, that lust, whatever it might be. And we say, I'm content where I'm at. So are you content to live without revival? If you are, you're just going to live without revival. But my prayer is that you have a desire to, God, to see God do something great in your life. 
And if you come and say, God, I am open. I am willing. My heart is ready to hear from you. My heart is ready to not only hear, but to respond as well. I'm willing to get rid of the things in my life that are hindering revival, that are hindering me from walking with you, from being close to you. Then you'll see God work. And God might point out something else in your life that you have to say, okay, (laughs) there's another thing I need to fix. There's another thing I need to get rid of. There's another thing I need to seek forgiveness for. Are you willing to let God work? And do you want revival?